take your Bibles, we're going to get into the book of Revelation. So Revelation chapter 13, we're going to begin in verse 16. And uh, the title of our message this morning is The Mark of the Beast. Very, very important. And uh, I've been kind of struggling all day with a sore throat. So if you pray for me, I appreciate that. And I'm going to ask that he would turn it up just a little bit and I'll just try to talk quieter. How's that sound? Uh, Lord, thank you so much. Your word just is a blessing to our lives, and I pray that you would just use the word now to show us your heart and to transform us through it now. In Jesus' name, amen. You know, when many people think of the book of Revelation, they, they, they think probably first and foremost of the mark of the beast, which is the name of the beast or the number of his name, which he tells us is 666. It's not 666, but 666. Very important distinction. Now, when you look at these verses, something that stands out to us is that there's this amazing contrast between what we see in this mark of the beast and also that it is an imitation of this seal on the forehead of this 144,000 Jewish witnesses who have dedicated their lives and followed the Lord wherever he goes. And this is an interesting contrast between them. Because really what we're seeing is that, that Satan or Lucifer is, of course, the great imitator. And here's what I mean by that. You know, we, we mentioned this a couple of weeks ago as we looked at, at the background and history of, of Satan himself, that his great sin was the desire to be like the Most High God, to be lifted up, to be honored as, you know, like unto the Most High God. Therefore, he wants to be worshipped, right? He wants to be recognized and honored. And so you see all of these imitations. And this mark of the beast is an imitation or, a, or an imitation of the seal upon the forehead of these witnesses for Christ. But you see other things too. Like, for example, you see what we can call an unholy trinity. Because you know the trinity of the Lord is God the Father, God the Son, and the Holy Spirit. But there's an unholy trinity in the sense that Lucifer or Satan wants to be like God. The Antichrist is thus like Jesus, the Son. And another beast arises that we're going to see earlier in this chapter that has two horns like a lamb but speaks like a dragon. And thus you have what could be called an unholy trinity. So we see this throughout the history and also now into prophecy. Interestingly, so far in the book of Revelation, we've seen the scenes that have been unfolding in heaven. Right? He's given us all of these amazing, powerful scenes that have unfolded in heaven. But now when you get to these verses, the scene is on the earth. In John's vision, he sees Jesus standing on Mount Zion, which is another uh, a way of saying Jerusalem. And with him are these 144,000 Jewish witnesses for Jesus Christ. And what's interesting is that they have the seal of God on their foreheads, and it is the name of the Lamb and of his Father. And these who are going through the tribulation are being victorious, even in the midst of all the difficulty and trouble that we see going on. So I want to contrast today this mark of the beast with the seal on the forehead of the 144,000 faithful witnesses. And there's much for us to learn as we look at these comparisons. So we start in Revelation 13, beginning in verse 16. And he causes all, the small and the great, and the rich and the poor, and the free men and the slaves, to be given a mark on their right hand or on their forehead. And he provides that no one should be able to buy or sell except the one who has the mark. No buying, no selling, no doing business of any kind. It's going to be very hard to even provide for your family in those days. That mark is either the name of the beast or the number of his name. Now, here is wisdom. Verse 18, let him who has understanding calculate or count the number of the beast, for the number is that of a man, and his number is 666. Chapter 14, verse 1. 
And I looked, and behold, the Lamb was standing on Mount Zion, and with him 144,000, having his name and the name of his Father written on their foreheads. Now, verse 2, look at verse 2. It's amazing. I love verse 2. And I heard this loud voice out of heaven, like the sound of many waters, like the sound of loud thunder. Have you ever been in a like a lightning storm and been so close to a lightning strike that the thunder just like shook the, the house? You know, you can just hear the windows, you know, like it's so loud. Ever experienced thunder that's so loud that, that it was like, you know, it's like intimidating in its power, right? That's how loud this is. Sound of many waters, sound of great thunder. But what is this sound? It tells us, he says, it's like the sound of harpists playing on their harps and these 144,000 singing a new song. In other words, this is loud, loud, so loud it's like thunderous loud music and singing. Now, you're going with me on this? I think, well, I think the Lord is telling me to tell you that worship is good when it's loud. There you go. It's in the Bible. It's in the, you cannot refute it. It's right there. His, it's, it's irrefutably there. But I love this right there, singing this new song before the throne, before the four living creatures and the elders. And no one can learn the song except the 144,000 who have been purchased from the earth. These are the ones who have not been defiled with women, for they have kept themselves chaste. These are the ones who follow the lamb wherever he goes. These have been purchased from among men as first fruits to God and to the lamb. And no lie was found in their mouth. They love the truth. They have the truth. They speak the truth for they are blameless. And it says in verse six, then I saw another angel flying in mid heaven having an eternal gospel to preach to those who live on the earth and to every nation and tribe and tongue and people. Now, would you look at that? Because that's an amazing thing right there. I mean, we know he's describing the tribulation period. And we all know that that's the wrath of God that's being poured out on the world. And here in the midst of the tribulation that's being poured out on the world, what do we see? We see the gospel declared to every nation, tongue, tribe, and people. I don't know about you. I think that's amazing. Because we see throughout it, you see this same point. 144,000 are witnesses of the gospel of Jesus Christ. And the two witnesses we saw in earlier chapters. And now this angel. Here's the point. Even though the wrath of God is being poured out, anyone who has a heart to follow after the Lord is welcomed by the Lord. In fact, he is reaching out to them with the gospel in so many ways. Even while the wrath of God is being poured out, the gospel is being given. Anybody who wants to turn to the Lord can turn to the Lord. I love that point. Then he says, and I saw another angel, a second one, following, saying, fallen, fallen is Babylon the great. Now, this is important. We're going to see the connection. Babylon is a city has long been destroyed. But he's bringing Babylon into this because of the symbolic nature of what the point is. And you're going to see this in chapters that are coming up soon. But this Babylon the great has a direct connection to the revealing of God's uh, a heart in the tribulation period. Notice, fallen, fallen is Babylon the great, she who made all the nations drink of the wine and the passion of her immorality. And then another angel, a third one, followed them, saying with a loud voice, if anyone worships the beast and his image and receives a mark on his forehead or upon his hand, He also will drink of the wine of the wrath of God, which is mixed in full strength in the cup of his anger. All right, these are the verses I want us to look at. Comparing and contrasting this mark of the beast that is on the right hand or forehead of those in the world and this seal on the forehead of his witnesses who have the name of the Lord and of his Father. Now, this is important because there's a powerful point, right? The victory begins where his name is written. God's name is written upon their their foreheads. In contrast, you see this mark of the beast, which is the name of the beast or the number of his name, 666. Now, verse 18 says, "Uh, let him who has wisdom understand to calculate or count uh, the number of the beast, 666. Now, some have taken that to mean that they should use a method called gematria. 
Gematria is from a Greek word, uh, same root as the word geometry, which means to calculate or to count. And the process of gematria is uh, taking names and words and then finding the numeric value of those names or words by adding the values of those letters together and uh, coming up with a calculation of the number, right? And we, we have uh, numbers that have values uh, today, you might say, because we use Roman numerals. And Roman numerals are that very thing, letters, but they have numeric values. Like, for example, uh, the Super Bowl is coming up, right? This is Super Bowl 52, right? This is coming up. The Super Bowl that's coming up now, that's the one that's coming up in February. You know the one? That's the one where the Eagles are playing the Patriots, that one. Yeah, that one. Um, 52 is L-I-I. So we see that letters, even today, have numerical value. Now, in the ancient Hebrew, in ancient Greek, not modern Greek, but ancient Greek, did the same thing. Now, we could use gematria in English if we took, let's say, A to equal 1, B to equal 2, C to equal 3, D to equal 4, like that. And then we could uh, take our names and calculate the value of those names, right? Just for fun, I did that. And my full name equals 966. I thought you might be interested to know that it uh, is not anything else but 966. <laughs> now, the point being here the, is that using this method, the problem with using this method is that many names come up to 666. You can actually get many names to do that. Um, for example, in the first century, many made much of the fact that Caesar Nero, his, the value of that name came up to 666. So thus, some were saying, ah, you see, Caesar Nero must have been the Antichrist. Problem with that is he died 30 years before this, so that didn't work. Uh, in the Middle Ages, some of the reformers often taught that the Catholic Church or various popes showed the value of their names to be 666. The Catholic Church didn't appreciate that. And so they shot back, showing that the numerical values of Martin Luther's name was 666. So there you go. Now, in, in uh, recent history, some have tried to suggest names like Napoleon or Hitler or Stalin, and they work with their names to create, you know, is it his full middle name or is it just the one letter of his middle name? And they keep playing this until they try to, to discover the number, you know, to come up with 666. Um, some recently have suggested, well, if you work with Benjamin Netanyahu's name enough, you can get that to equal 666. Some have suggested Recep Erdogan, who's the president of Turkey, you can get his name if you work it just right. You know, although others have pointed out, well, yeah, well, Michelle Bachman and Sarah Palin's name also can be worked that way. So, you know, the point is that when the Antichrist appears on the scene, the, the revealing of the Antichrist will be obvious because he will be the one that negotiates the peace treaty with Israel, but the confirmation of that will be in the value of his name. Now, what is the significance of 666? It's very important. Now, some of you say, well, it's the, it's the number of incompletions, the number of man. I mean, seven is the number of perfection or completion, Thus, six is the lack of that. That's the number of men. Well, I think there's some value in that statement. That's true. Um, however, I think that the connection really goes back to Babylonian occultic religion. That's why the significance of him bringing Babylon into the book of Revelation is very important because you see this connection to the occultic religious practices in ancient Babylon. And in fact... Of the ancient religious occultic practices of Babylon, which was a, a blend of religion and astrology and mathematics. So here's what I mean by that. They had 36 gods, and they were each one represented by a number. Now, they took the constellations of the starry heavens, divided them into 36 constellations, 10 degrees of each of the portionments of the starry heavens. And then they assigned a, or found a God associated with that constellation, gave him a name and a number. Then they, they took what is called the magic square. Maybe you've heard of the magic square. And it comes out of ancient Babylon. And they would take these 36 numbers and create six rows 
and six columns, each with six numbers. Of course, that adds up to 36. If you add one, two, plus three, plus four, plus five, come all the way to 36, you come up with 666. But they would, they would take this magic square and they would align the numbers in such a way that the, uh, each row added up to, every single row added up to 111. Thus, 111 times 6 is 666. What's interesting is that you can also take the columns and they each add up to 111, thus the 666. In fact, you can even take the diagonals and they add up to 111. And so the number 666, then this magic square, was engraved in a gold amulet worn by the, the priests of that occult religion. The reason why it was in gold, because gold represented the sun. It was yellow. And so the sun was, in fact, the, the god who was above all other gods. In fact, in their particular occultic religion, that god who was above all other gods was the one who created all the other gods. And thus, his number, since he was over all the rest of them, his was 600. And 66, you guessed it correctly. And thus, the representation of the Antichrist is found in ancient occultic religions of Babylon, which come into the book of Revelation. I don't know about you, but I find that very fascinating. And the ancient occultic priests believed that they could predict the, cult of the future using this magic square. And there's a lot of uh, um, theorists conspiracy theorists today who try to make much of the fact that they can find the magic square and 666 on many of the Washington, D.C. architectural features. I'll leave that um, particular theory up to you. All right, now back to uh, Revelation 14. We're seeing this contrast now as we see the background, the significance of this mark. But the, the significance of the fact that it is upon their forehead must not be missed because of what it represents. And really what we can see out of that is to let the Lord be the Lord of your mind because of the significance of it. Where does this come from? It actually has a long, long history. It goes all the way back in the scriptures, all the way back to Deuteronomy when Moses was speaking to the people of Israel before they entered into the promised land. Notice what he said in Deuteronomy chapter 6. You shall love the Lord your God with all of your heart and with all of your soul and with all of your might. Now, that's very important, as you might know in Scripture. That's one of the high points of the entire Bible. And in fact, Jesus was asked at one point, what is the foremost, the greatest that God has ever spoken to us? And what did he answer? Right from Deuteronomy, you shall love the Lord your God with all your heart, soul, mind, and strength. How important is this? He says, this is so important. I'm still in Deuteronomy 6. These words, which I'm commanding you today shall be on your heart and you shall teach them diligently to your sons and you shall talk about them when you sit in your house and when you walk by the way and when you lie down and when you get up, which is pretty much a lot of the time. And then he says, you shall bind them as a sign on your hand and they shall be as frontals on your forehead. How interesting is that? You shall write them even on the doorposts of your house and on your gates. The context is loving God with all your heart. And then bind them on your forehead. See, the, the mind that God is giving to us, that's the key, right? We have the, 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 the power of the significance of the transformed mind. What does uh, Paul say in Romans 12? Be transformed by the renewing of your mind. Romans chapter 8, set your mind on the things of the Spirit. In the Gospels, it says we have the mind of Christ. And so he's telling us this very important thing because it's from the love that you have after the Lord, you will find that it brings about in you a settled peace on your mind and on your heart. Isaiah 26, 3, the steadfast of mind you will keep in perfect peace because he trusts in you. See, you look at these 144,000 and they have the name of the lamb and of the father written on them and the, you, show, you see the expression of their love. 
They love, they're, they're like dedicated unto the Lord and they love and it's written on their, on their foreheads. Now this is important because it is a great contrast to the enemy, right? And his, his scheme is not love, but really is fear. And you see one of the great uh, attacks and schemes is to generate fear. In fact, when the Antichrist sets himself up in the temple to be worshipped, people do so because of fear. If you don't have the mark of the beast, you must be killed, the scripture says. Fear. And in fact, isn't that what we're seeing in modern day terrorism? What is the whole point of terrorism? Isn't it not to strike fear and terror into the peoples in which that sort of thing is inflicted? That is the enemy's scheme right there. But what does the scripture say? It says, God has not given us a spirit of fear, but of love, power, and a sound mind. God has not given us a spirit of fear. Fear is of the enemy. Fear is that control. In fact, you look at the occultic religions and witchcraft even, and it is fear by which they control the people that fall under those, quote, spells. And so God has not given us a spirit of fear. Perfect love casts out fear, John wrote in another place. God wants us to recognize the significance of this. It's love. What is the fruit of the Spirit? told to us in Galatians chapter 5, the fruit of the Spirit is love. That's the first and foremost. And of course, there's joy and peace and kindness and all the others. But the first and foremost is that the work of God is that you love. And the, the result of that is peace in the heart. I was thinking of uh, a time in Hillsborough when this fellow came in, uh, no appointment, just walked in the doors and asked if he could speak to a pastor. And I was available, so I sat with him, and he was an Iranian fellow. So I said, uh, nice to meet you. What can I do for you? And he, and he said, I'm Muslim. And uh, I said, well, it's nice to meet you. I'm glad you're here. What can I do for you? And he said, I have come from Iran. I've only been here a few months, and I am tired of a God of hate. Talk to me about a God of love. Uh, now, that was a beautiful conversation. And in fact, we got to baptize him in our own baptistry in Hillsborough just a few months after that. Amen? God uses love. See, this is important. Write this on your heart. Write this on your mind. And then he shows us this in Revelation 14. You see such a powerful thing. These 144,000 witnesses, you see them worshiping, right, in this loud song. And, and I love the fact that there is power in praise. There's, he's making a lot of it. You know, there's worship in heaven. We're going to be worshiping a lot in heaven. You see so many evidences of worship, the song that's alive. See, now, the Antichrist will set himself up to be worshipped in the temple and honored there. But it's only by fear. But these 144,000, they worship because of love, because their hearts are stirred up. It's a new song. A new song in Scripture is always good. It's a declaration of praise and rejoicing. Psalm 98.1 is like another place. Oh, sing to the Lord a new song, for he has done wonderful things. His right hand and his holy arm have gained the victory for him. Uh, and we are glad. We rejoice. Sing a new song. The four living beings and the 24 elders, they sing a new song. And the myriad of angels, they sing a song. One of the most important expressions of joy is when you've got a song in your heart. I was thinking of uh, a time that one of the elders from Hillsborough and I were on the East Coast. And we had been in some meetings and we had some extra time. So we were just driving around New York City and just seeing the sights and uh, just, you know, chatting as we go. And at, at some point, out of the blue, he says, quick, what song is in your mind right now? And I had a song that I had in the back of my head. Uh, even while we're having the conversation, I had a song going in my head. Um, and, and so, you know, it's, God wants us to have like a joyful, there's a song in my heart sort of thing. I remember when I was in high school and my first job, like my first real job, uh, not counting picking berries, because I picked berries for many years, but my first job was to be a janitor in a school. And I remember 
I'm just pushing this broom down the hallways or moving the mop, you know, uh, back and forth. We, I'm trying to mop the entire cafeteria. And, uh, but I'm whistling, right? Because during the weekends, I, I was worshiping. I was leading on my guitar at this lo- little tiny country church. And, and, and at school, I'm pushing this broom or doing the mop, and I'm whistling these worship songs because uh, God wants a joyful expression in our hearts of, of, of joy. We're going to worship in heaven. We might as well start right now. And there's a joy that comes from us that stirs us up. Now, there's power in praise even when you're going through difficulty. There's power in praise that, that, that speaks life to the soul. I remember when our, when our daughter was killed, oh, I would just listen to worship because it spoke healing. It spoke healing to my soul. Remember when Paul and Silas uh, were arrested in, the, uh, in Philippi? Remember that the magistrates dragged them out, you know, and uh, had them beaten with rods as thick as a man's finger? I don't think we can even relate to what they suffered. And then had them thrown into this inner prison, dark, dank, cold, damp. And it tells us that, this is Acts 16, about midnight, Paul and Silas were praying and singing hymns of praise to God, and the prisoners were listening to them, and suddenly there came a great earthquake, so the foundations of the prison house were shaken, and immediately all the doors were opened and everyone's chains were unfastened. What a, what a picture. You know, when I, when, I, when I think of scenes in the scriptures, I love to see in my mind how they might unfold. And this is a powerful one. I imagine there they are, beaten, chained, cold. And, and Paul says, Silas, you okay? Because I'm hurt. I hurt bad. Me too. You want to sing? You know, that let's sing that hymn. So, oh, that one, I know that hymn. Great is thy faithfulness, O God, my Father. There is no shadow of turning with thee. Thou changest not thy compassions, they fail not, as thou hast been, forever will be. It's like, imagine them singing something like that. And then it says the prisoners were listening. Don't you think that prisoners listening to that would have just been so taken by all this? I want a God like that. I want a God like that. That just strengthens people that they could actually sing in times like this. I want a God like that. Because that's really what you see in in Revelation 14. 14, you see these 144,000 that have such a heart. Like you you want to just follow what their example is. Like I want a God like that. And you see their faithful heart that bears godly fruit in their lives. What a description of their faithfulness, their following after the Lord, how they follow the Lamb wherever He goes. What a description. I love that. Follow is the Lamb wherever He goes. You know, one of the first praise songs of the modern praise song era was one of the simplest, one of the most powerful. Maybe you remember it. I have decided to follow Jesus. No turning back. No turning back. Like, I've decided to follow. What did Jesus say? Take up your cross daily and follow. Like, they follow with all their heart. Like, they've made their mind. They made their decision. You know, when we get nearer and nearer to the end of the age, clearly there is spiritual battle. Storm clouds are rising. We are living in days of spiritual conflict. Like, now, now there's no time to be in the, in, the, in the middle, the neutral position. Jesus says, if you're not for me, you're against me. There's no time. Now is the day to like make your mind, to decide, to follow. But if you decide that you will follow, then what is he saying to us? Then you follow with all of your heart. One of the verses of that, of that simple, simple chorus was this. The cross before me, the world behind me. No turning back. No turning back. The cross before me means you have set the course. You've made your mind. You have settled this in your heart. 
the cross is before me. I will live my life in that direction. And that means that the world is behind you. That's the right way to live. No turning back. No turning back. Settle this in your mind. He's calling us to understand the nature of spiritual warfare, spiritual battle. So to settle this is like to be like one of those 144,000 who've got this faithful heart that follows the Lord and honors Him with how they live their lives. Settle this issue and follow with all your heart. Let's pray.